Alright, I'm just gonna riffle through the cards and say stuff anywhere you like. Oh, okay. I know this one. I'm just gonna dribble through the cards. Stop, stop me anywhere you like, okay? Just stop me anywhere at all. I've seen this one before. Just pick anyone, anyone at all, anyone at all, anyone. This is the one where the card ends up in your wallet. Chances are, if you're a magician, you've countered this at least once. You pull out a deck of cards, you ask somebody to select one, and before the trick's even begun, they already say, I know this one. I would find this happening to me when I didn't even know what trick I was going to do. I was literally just improvising. I would just spread the cards, have somebody take one, or just say stop, somebody in the distance. Already, they had a preconceived notion in their mind about what I was going to do, even if I didn't. I used to just laugh this off and take it as characteristic of laymen in general, and just the notion that to them, a card trick is a card trick. Oh, this is the one where I pick a card and then you find it. That's what most card tricks are to most people. For a magician, pick a card is the beginning of a near infinite number of possible tricks. For a spectator, it's the beginning of one trick. It took me a while, but eventually I realized that the fact that it was happening when I didn't even know what trick I was going to perform was telling, not about their mindset, but about mine. I realized that if I didn't know what I was going to do, if I didn't know what the trick was or what it was even about, then the audience could do nothing but project onto it what they assume. And they can only do that based on their own prior experience. And most of their experience tells them that all card tricks are pick a card, find a card. As, as many ways as we may feel creative of pulling a card out of producing it in a different way, as soon as you say, is this your card? It's essentially the same trick to most spectators. Yeah, the card was lost, he found it. Now you might think that the answer here is to get more creative with how you find the card or get more creative with how you have the card selected so that they don't recognize it as one of these standard dribble, say stop, or spreading the cards out or pick a card. You know, literally, you can just spread the cards without saying a word and somebody may already think, I've seen this one before. Even if they don't say it out loud, somebody is thinking it. So, unless you're going to start a trick in some way that makes it painfully clear that it's not pick a card, find a card, well, how do you get around this? Then it hit me. If it's happening when I don't know what the trick is about, maybe it's because I haven't made the trick about something. It's not just not knowing what the trick is, but it's that there's no substance to it. It just means make them something a little bit more than, is this your card? One way or another, a trick will have a premise. And if you don't put anything on that trick beyond, is this your card, then that's the premise of the trick. They pick one, I find it. So how do you add something more to the trick than just what's physically happening? There are lots of ways to do this. You can do it by simply wrapping the trick in something else, literally changing the props. If it's a card trick, maybe instead of using a regular deck of cards, you use a tarot deck. Pokemon playing cards, or Magic the Gathering, sports collecting cards, I don't know if those are even still a thing. These types of approaches can carry with them certain connotations. For example, the tarot cards obviously carry a lot of meaning and can tap into people's presumed beliefs and assumptions about the world. So that may be something you want to play with, or that may be something you want to avoid for that reason. But even just taking something that's normally done with a playing card and swapping it out for a collectible sports card, a torn and restored card suddenly becomes that much more meaningful. As we saw with David Copperfield performing Chris Kenner's Torn Asunder using the baseball card that Wayne Gretzky owned. So it wasn't just to anyone watching, oh, that's the one where he rips up the card and puts it back together. There was something at stake. There was something that held value, not just to the magician. Because most card tricks, let's be honest, they really only mean something to the magician. Other ways you can do it are just literally in the things you say, the words that you use. Instead of starting by taking out a deck of cards, spreading them and saying, pick a card, any card, why not ask them a question? Do you believe in free will? Well, suddenly that's far more interesting than pick a card, any card. Pick a card, any card only ends one way. I pick it, he's gonna find it. Do you believe in free will? Well, that has endless possibilities attached to it. You might think the answer tends to be binary, yes or no, but maybe it's somewhere in between. Maybe the spectator thinks it's a combination of the two. Maybe they think that there are certain amounts of destiny, but there are certain minor ways we can affect life. But if you're improvising even, if I don't know what trick I'm going to do, just that simple question, do you believe in free will? Their answer alone already gives me so much more to work with than just a control and a production. 
Now I've got something that they are emotionally invested in. And again, it's, it's a simple, silly question. Free will. But even in a card trick where literally all I know I'm going to do is somehow control that card and then find it later, but I've got nothing else to it than that, by just asking that question, I create a hook that creates so much more out of the trick than just, is this your card? Now, improvisational situations are one thing, but if you're talking about a trick or a routine that you've worked on for months or years, you have so much more potential to work with. You know what you're going to say. You can plan ahead or you can build on it. You can find something within the trick that speaks to you on a personal level and take that as a theme and expand it to the whole trick. So the moment you make the trick about something more than a card trick, or, you know, the cups and balls, anything really, it doesn't have to be a card trick. But the moment you make it about anything more than just a trick, you instantly elevate it. And not necessarily talking about turning everything into high art, but I am talking about giving your audience something to grab onto, something to draw them in, something to give them an interest. So just giving it just that little something extra makes the trick about more than just, you know, a piece of paper that has some ink on it. So while changing the props can be a good start, sometimes it can only get you so far, especially if it's something that everybody else is doing too. So how do you take your chop cup routine or your cups and balls routine and turn it into something more? Well, there, there are a lot of great examples. For example, Ricky Jay's classic turned it into more of a history lesson and takes you through essentially all of time with this one trick in this beautifully constructed routine where you can have something like David Regal's Cups and Balls and Cups and Balls, which is another fantastic take on the routine. And the trick is about his childhood and, and how he got started in magic with that play set. Or you have Tommy Wonders, phenomenal two cup routine. Now this is an example where he hasn't done much to necessarily change the props and the plot in any dramatic way, yet he still recontextualized the entire routine. The final load is something that's in sight at all times. And while it is still a big ball that comes out, I guess he has kind of changed the props in that he's made it the pom-pom and the, and the sock that he keeps the cups in. But the, the structure of the routine and everything, just the way it feels, it becomes much more about his interaction with the audience and their interaction with the magic and his interaction with the magic, as opposed to being just about getting to those final loads. In fact, if you've seen Tommy Wonder's routine, you know he has a final load that happens in the middle of the routine. So his quote unquote final load ultimately becomes a through line, almost a running gag and callback at the end, which again, recontextualizes the way the routine is perceived. And similarly, David Regal's Cups and Balls and Cups and Balls, the final load is a callback to the initial premise. Now, this is actually a very clever approach because it kind of creates a little loophole where the audience can actually say, do the one with the little cups and the little balls. Well, in David Regal's routine, you could be giving away the ending or you're just giving away literally his introduction, the way he opens the trick. And because his climax is a callback to that introduction, to describe the trick as being about that doesn't necessarily spoil the trick. And similarly with the card to wallet, for example, if you begin your routine by pulling out your wallet and taking out a dollar bill, and then you make the routine about the value of a dollar and how we place value on things arbitrarily versus intrinsically, well, this is now your opening and it's really more about the dollar bill and the wallet is introduced as a side note. And so if you make your card to wallet routine about say that dollar bill and the value and, and such, and that dollar bill plays into the larger routine, well, now somebody can say, oh, do the one with the dollar bill rather than do the one where the card ends up in your wallet. So you've given them something else to relate the trick to other than just the magical punchline. And that's not to say you want them to forget the magical punchline to a trick, but rather if you make it about something more that they can take away, then they're not going to dismiss it as just another card trick or, oh, I've seen this one before or spoil the ending to their friends. They can talk about what the trick is about rather than what happens in it. Now, this is arguably what we do with all art. We, we put some meaning to it beyond the objective and literal interpretation. And if you want to be expressing yourself with your art and with your performance, then that's certainly a reason to do this. But even without that, even putting the art aside, even taking the art out of magic and just thinking about the experience that your audience has and the experience that you have. And if you want to avoid the experience of just dribbling cards and having somebody say, I've seen this one, well then, 
this is probably something that's worth considering, trying to make your tricks about something. And given the way that so many perceive all card tricks as being a variation of the exact same trick, this is a very important thing to consider, in my opinion at least, when you're considering your magic and especially your card tricks. Whether it's asking your audience a question or playing on perception or playing on preconceived notions and assumptions or just adding a theme or an idea or mentioning a dream or changing the props. Give your magic intent. Give it a purpose. You don't have to be striving for some deeper meaning about the universe, but just give your magic intent. Give it a goal beyond, I'm going to find your card, or I'm going to produce this lemon, or I'm going to make these coins travel from one hand to another. Just give it a reason, just give it a why. Even if it's just wanting to find out more about your spectator is in and of itself, making your magic about something more than just a card trick. Even though I've been trying to do this more and more and make my magic about something other than just the outward reality of the effect, it's not a perfect solution. I'm certain that I will still have times where I ask a question, do you believe in free will? And then dribble the cards. Somebody's still going to say, and if they don't say it, somebody will still be thinking probably, oh, I've seen this one. But I'd like to think that by doing this, it's going to happen less. And if it happens less, then that should mean that the audience is engaged more, which means that they should be getting more out of my magic than just, oh, it's just some other guy doing card tricks. You want them to remember you. You don't want them to remember, I saw a guy do a card trick once, or I saw a guy who could juggle, or, or I saw a guy who could shuffle the deck in really crazy ways and fancy cuts. These, these are things that they can remember, but they're superficial in the end. And hopefully you want your audience to experience something just a little bit more than that. All right, peace out. Remember, let us never forget.